My name is Dan Lubin. I'm a research physicist at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. And most recently I've been working on uh, solar variability in climate. In particular, I'm focusing on, on the Maunder Minimum. The Maunder Minimum was a period in the uh, second half of the 17th century and the early 18th century where the climate changed. It cooled in, in the northern hemisphere considerably, and that is the one uh, major climate change that we can uh, attribute mainly to solar forcing, to changes in the solar output. The sun was uh, several tenths of a percent dimmer during the Maunder Minimum as compared with today, and uh, climate models show that, that that drives a lot of the climate cooling we know from the historical records that occurred during the Maunder Minimum. For example, during the Maunder Minimum, the Thames froze over regularly during, the, uh, during winter. Uh, the Baltic Sea froze over in parts regularly during winter, and at one point back in 1658 there was a war between Sweden and Denmark, and the Swedish army took advantage of that to march across the frozen Baltic Sea to attack Denmark. So climate change has all kinds of uh, national security implications uh, even back in the 17th century, and uh, that's another aspect of today's climate change we need to focus in on. How will uh, the balance of power, the balance of economics shift in a climate change scenario? But uh, the challenge with the Maunder Minimum is the only direct observation we have of the sun during that time was there was a, a total absence of sunspots for about 45 years. And that gives us a clue that the magnetic activity on the sun was considerably lower than at, during than at present. And um, also it gives us some ways to try to estimate what the uh, change in solar forcing was in magnitude. Uh, and we think that it was about two to four times larger than the amplitude of the present-day solar cycle. And so there are two, uh, two research questions that, uh, that this brings up. The first is that uh, what happens if the Maunder Minimum were to occur later this century? Uh, over the past century, the sun has been relatively high in its output and also very quiet. Um, and that may change. Some of the analysis of the time series of solar variability over the past several centuries suggests that we may be due for, for another grand minimum event, maybe not as big as the Maunder Minimum, but maybe as big. And so the question is, if it were to occur later this century in a climate warming scenario, what would be the change in climate? Would it offset global warming due to greenhouse gases? And uh, I have done some climate modeling work on that, and the short answer is no. There would be a slight cooling if the sun were to go into another Maunder Minimum event, probably two to three tenths of a degree, but that would not offset the climate warming that occurs due to the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, even in the most optimistic scenario of greenhouse gas controls, a Maunder Minimum would not offset that. Um, the other question that I'm working on is just how frequently do these, these events occur? There doesn't seem to be any periodicity to these grand minimum events in solar output. So, the way I'm addressing that problem is to, uh, is to make observations of sun-like stars uh, in the solar neighborhood, of which there are several thousand to choose from, and I'm measuring various uh, indicators of magnetic activity and age of the stars. For example, one uh, fairly c uh, compelling indicator of magnetic activity is uh, the emission in the, in the calcium-2 lines in the ultraviolet, the calcium-2 H and K lines. This is a standard measure, it's called chromospheric activity, and that's readily measured at Lick Observatory with their, their high-resolution spectrograph. I'm also measuring lithium abundance in stars, which is another indicator of whether a star is young or old. Um, generally, we think that, well, the, the common proposition is that a star that is in very low, a very low state of activity as measured by its chromospheric activity, might be a Maunder Minimum candidate. But what the lithium measurements are showing us is that many of these stars are simply very old stars. They're near the end of their main sequence lifetime. They've spun down. They're not as magnetically active. So that's the distinction I'm trying to work on right now, is how many of these possible Maunder Minimum analog candidates really are stars that might be in a Maunder Minimum state as opposed to just very old stars. So those are the two uh, research questions I'm trying to address right now. So Dan, uh, there's been some recent research, and I think some of it's been misreported in the media, about the possibility of the, uh, the, uh, the sun going into some kind of a minimum, maybe we're in a minimum right now and we're not quite coming out of it, or perhaps the, the next solar cycle might be much lower than, than the current one. Can you, can you expand on that? Well, I, just on a statistical basis, um, 
you know, zero order statistics, we are probably due for some re reduction in solar irradiance compared to the past 70 or 80 years. Uh, whether that will be a monitor minimum, you know, that, that was the deepest one we know of, that's hard to say. Uh, but the, the bottom line is it will not offset the climate warming that we are causing due to greenhouse gas emissions. It will reduce it a little bit, and in fact, one interesting result from our climate modeling studies um, is that a, a, in an, an enhanced greenhouse gas scenario, where greenhouse gases, where carbon dioxide is up at 500 parts per million instead of uh, current day values, is that um, in, in, some, in some parts of the world, a monitor minimum actually increases the warming. And it does that by shifting the northern hemisphere circulation into a, a low index um, mode of the North Atlantic Oscillation. It's important to keep in mind that uh, greenhouse gas warming and climate warming are not just a radiative balance between uh, incoming solar radiation and radiation trapped in the atmosphere. There's also feedback with the dynamics, the large-scale dynamics of the atmosphere, and that's what climate modeling tells us. It allows us to diagnose how major weather patterns will change in response to greenhouse gas uh, forcing or solar forcing. And what we see with the with increased greenhouse gases and a slight reduction in solar forcing consistent with another Maunder minimum, we see a change in the North Atlantic Oscillation such that we would see enhanced warming in western Greenland and therefore an accelerated uh, melting of the Greenland ice sheet um, and also uh, some enhanced cooling in, in northern Europe. Uh, so there are regional changes uh, that occur when we uh, change greenhouse gas emissions as well. Okay, has your solar research shed any light on the um, the uh, cosmic ray theory that's in so much in vogue uh, in regard to uh, global warming? I, I have not worked on that directly, uh, mm -hmm. but the people I have uh, spoken to and, and heard talks in meetings, uh, their, their quick answer is they don't really even understand the physics yet mm -hmm. of, of that issue. So I think that's, in this, at this stage, it's in, in the realm of zeroth order speculation. Perfect.